Four Arguments for the Elimination of Television by Jerry Mander Argument 1. The Mediation of Experience As humans have moved into totally artificial environments, our direct contact with and knowledge of the planet has been snapped. Disconnected, like astronauts floating in space, we cannot know up from down or truth from fiction. Conditions are appropriate for the implantation of arbitrary realities. Television is one recent example of this, a serious one, since it greatly accelerates the problem. Three, the walling of awareness. During a six-month period in 1973, the New York Times reported the following scientific findings. A major research institute spent more than $50,000 to discover that the best bait for mice is cheese. Another study found that mother's milk was better balanced nutritionally for infants than commercial formulas. That study also proved that mother's milk was better for human infants than cow's milk or goat's milk. A third study established that a walk is considerably healthier for the human respiratory and circulatory systems, in fact, for overall health and vitality, than a ride in a car. Bicycling was also found to be beneficial. A fourth project demonstrated that the juice of fresh oranges has more nutritional value than either canned or frozen orange juice. A fifth study proved conclusively that infants <coughs> who are touched a lot frequently grow into adults with greater self-confidence and have a more integrated relationship with the world than those who are not touched. This study found that touching, not merely sexual touching, but any touching of one person by another, seemed to aid general health and even mental development among adults as well as children. The remarkable thing about these five studies, of course, is that anyone should have found it necessary to undertake them. That some people did find them necessary can only mean that they felt there was some uncertainty about how the answers would turn out. And yet, anyone who has seen a mouse eating cheese or has been touched by the hand of another person already knows a great deal about these things, assuming he or she gives credence to personal observation. Similarly, anyone who has ever considered the question of artificial milk versus human milk is unlikely to assume that Nestle's or Similac will improve on a feeding arrangement that accounted for the growth of every human infant before modern times. That any people retain doubts on these questions is symptomatic of two unfortunate conditions of modern existence. Human beings no longer trust personal observation, even of the self-evident, until it is confirmed by scientific or technological institutions. Human beings have lost insight into natural processes, how the world works, the human role as one of many interlocking parts of the worldwide ecosystem, because natural processes are now exceedingly difficult to observe. These two conditions combine to limit our knowledge and understanding to what we are told. They also leave us unable to judge the reliability or unreliability of the information we go by. The problem begins with the physical environment in which we live mediated environments. When he was about five years old, my son Kai asked me, Daddy, who built Mount Tamalpay? Kai's question shocked me. I said, nobody built Mount Tamalpay. It grew up out of the earth thousands of years ago. No person could build a mountain. I don't think this satisfied him, but it did start me on a new train of thought. I think that was the first moment that I really looked around at the urban world in which he and I and the rest of our family and the majority of the people in this country live. I wanted to know how he could have gotten the notion that human beings are responsible for the construction of mountains. I soon realized that his mistaken impression was easy to understand. It was one that we all share on a deeper level. Most Americans spend their lives within environments created by human beings. This is less the case if you live in Montana than if you live in Manhattan, but it is true to some extent all over the country. Natural environments have largely given way to human-created environments. What we see, hear, touch, taste, smell, feel, and understand about the world has been processed for us. Our experiences of the world can no longer be called direct or primary. They are secondary, mediated experiences. When we are walking in a forest, we can see and feel what the planet produces directly. Forests grow on their own without human intervention. When we see a forest, or experience it in other ways, we can count on the experience being directly between us and the planet. 
it is not mediated, interpreted, or altered. On the other hand, when we live in cities, no experience is directly between us and the planet. Virtually all experience is mediated in some way. Concrete covers whatever would grow from the ground. Buildings block the natural vistas. The water we drink comes from a faucet, not from a stream or the sky. All foliage has been confined by human considerations and redesigned according to human tastes. There are no wild animals, there are no rocky terrains, there is no cycle of bloom and decline. There is not even night and day. No food grows anywhere. Most of us give little importance to this change in human experience of the world, if we notice it at all. We are so surrounded by a reconstructed world that it is difficult to grasp how astonishingly different it is from the world of only 100 years ago, and that it bears virtually no resemblance to the world in which human beings lived for four million years before that. That this might affect the way we think, including our understanding of how our lives are connected to any non-human system, is rarely considered. In fact, most of us assume that human understanding is now more thorough than before, that we know more than we ever did. This is because we have such faith in our rational intellectual processes and the institutions we have created that we fail to observe their limits. I have heard small children ask whether apples and oranges grow in stores. Of course not, we tell them. Fruit grows from the ground somewhere out in the countryside and then it's put into trucks and brought to the stores. But is this true? Have you seen that? Do you have a sense that what you were eating was once alive, growing on its own? We learn in school that fruit grows from the ground. We see pictures of fruit growing. But when we live in cities, confined to the walls and floors of our concrete environments, we don't actually see the slow process of a blossom appearing on a tree, then becoming a bud that grows into an apple. We learn this, but we can't really know what it means, or that a whole cycle is operating sky to ground to root through tree to bud ripening into fruit that we can eat, nor do we see particular value in this knowledge. <coughs> it remains an idea to us, an abstraction that is difficult to integrate into our consciousness with the direct experience of the process. Therefore we don't develop a feeling about it, a caring. In the end, how can our children or we really grasp that fruit growing from trees has anything to do with humans growing from eating the fruit? We have learned that water does not really originate in the pipes where we get it. We are educated to understand that it comes from sky. We have seen that, it is true. Lands in some faraway mountains, flows into rivers which flow into little reservoirs, and then somehow it all goes through pipes into the sinks in our homes and then back out to where? The ocean. We learn there is something called evaporation that takes the water we don't need up to the sky. But is this true? Is there a pattern to it? How does it collect in the sky? Is it okay to rearrange the cycle with cloud seeding? Is it okay to collect the water in dams? Does anyone else need water? Do plants drink it? How do they get it? Does water go into the ground? In cities it rolls around on concrete and then pours into sewers. Since we are unable to observe most of the cycle, we learn about it in knowledge museums, schools, textbooks. We study to know. What we know is what we have studied. We know what the books say. What the books say is what the authors of the books learn from experts, who from time to time turn out to be wrong. Everyone knows about night and day. Half the time it's dark, half the time it's light. However, it doesn't work that way in our homes or outside in the streets. There is always light, and it is always the same, controlled by an automatic switch downtown. The stars are obscured by the city glow. The moon is washed out by a filter of light. It becomes a semi-moon, and our awareness of it inevitably dims. We say it is night, but darkness moods and feelings lie dormant in us. Faced with real darkness, we become frightened, overreact like a child whose parents have always left the light on. In three generations since Edison, we have become creatures of light alone. One evening during 1975, I went with my family to a small park in the middle of San Francisco to watch a partial eclipse of the moon. We saw it rise above the buildings, but it had little power. Hundreds of street lamps, flashing signs, and lighting buildings intruded. The street lamps, those new mercury vapor arcs that give off a harsh pinkish-white light, were the worst problem. It was difficult to feel anything for the moon seen through this pinkish filter. The children became bored. We went for an ice cream. Later that same evening, I went alone to a different park on a high hill. I imagine the city lights gone dark. I turned them off in my mind. Without the buildings diverting me, 
I gained the briefest feeling for how the moon must have been experienced by human beings of earlier centuries, why whole cultures and religions were based upon it, how they could know every nuance of its cycle and those of the stars, and how they could understand its connection with planting times, tides, and human fertility. Only recently has our own culture produced new studies confirming the moon's effect on our bodies and minds, as well as its effect on plants. Earlier cultures, living without filters, did not need to rediscover the effects. People remained personally sensitive to their connections with the natural world. For most of us, the sensitivity and knowledge or science of older cultures is gone. If there are such connections, we have little awareness of them. Our environment has intervened. Not long after the eclipse I just described, my wife, Annika, was told by her 90-year-old grandmother that we should not permit our children to sleep where the moonlight could bathe them. Born in pre-industrial Yugoslavia and having spent most of her life without technology, the old woman said the moon had too much power. One night, our oldest son, Yari, who was eight at the time, spent an evening at a friend's house high on a hill, sleeping near a curtainless south-facing window. He called us in the morning to tell us of a disturbing thing that had happened to him during the night. He had awakened to find himself standing flush against the window, facing the full moon. He had gotten out of bed while still asleep, walked over to the window, and stood facing the moon. Only then did he wake up. He was frightened, he said, more by the oddness of the experience than any sense of real danger. Actually, he thought it rather special, but didn't like having an experience different from what is expected and accepted, which is not to experience the power of the moon. He had been taught that what he had just been through couldn't happen. He wished it hadn't, and it hasn't since. Yari, like most of the rest of us, does not wish to accept the validity of his personal experience. The people who define the moon are now the scientists, astronomers, and geologists who tell us which interactions with the world are possible and which are not, ridiculing any evidence to the contrary. The moon's cycle affects the oceans, they say, but it doesn't affect the body. Does that sound right to you? It doesn't to me. And yet, removed from any personal awareness of the moon, unable even to see it very well, let alone experience it, how are we to know what is right and what is wrong? Most of us cannot say if, this very evening, the moon will be out at all. Perhaps you are a jogger. I am not, but friends have told me how that experience has broken them out of technologically created notions of time and distance. I have one friend in San Francisco who runs from his Russian Hill apartment to Ocean Beach and then back again every morning. This is a distance of about eight miles. There was a time, he told me, when the idea of walking or bicycling that distance seemed impossible to him. Now the distance seems manageable, even easy, near, not far. He's recovered a personal sense of distance. I have made similar discoveries myself. <clears throat> Some years ago, I decided to walk to work every day instead of driving. It changed getting to work into a pleasurable experience. No traffic jams or parking hassles, and I would stop now and then for coffee and a chat with a friend. More important, it changed my conception of distance. My office was 20 blocks from my home, about a 30-minute walk. I noticed that walking that distance was extremely easy. I hadn't known that my previous conception of 20 blocks was one which technology had created. My knowledge was car knowledge. I had become mentally and physically a car person. Now I was connecting distance and range to my body, making the conception personal rather than mechanical outside myself. On another occasion, while away on a camping trip with my two children, I learned something about internal versus institutional technological rhythm. The three of us were suffering an awful boredom at first. My children complained that there was nothing to do. We were all so attuned to events coming along at urban speed in large, prominent packages that our bodies and minds could not attune to the smaller, more subtle events of a forest. By the second day, however, the children began to throw rocks into a stream, and I found myself hearing things that I hadn't heard the day before. Wind, the crunch of leaves underfoot. The air was somehow clearer and fresher than it seemed to have been the day before. I began to wander around aimlessly but interestedly. On the third day, the children began to notice tiny creatures. They watched them closely and learned more about their habits in that one day than I know even now. They were soon imitating squirrels, birds, snakes, and they began to invent some animals. By the fourth day, our urban rhythm memory had given way to the natural rhythms of the forest. We started to take in all kinds of things that a few days before we hadn't noticed were there. 
It was as if our awareness was a dried-out root system that had to be fed. Returning to the city a few days later, we could feel a speed up take place. It was like running to catch up with a train. <coughs> Sensory Deprivation Environments The modern office building is the archetypal example of the mediated environment. It contains nothing that did not first exist as a design plan in a human mind. The spaces are square, flat, and small, eliminating a sense of height, depth, and irregularity. The decor is rigidly controlled to a bland uniformity from room to room and floor to floor. The effect is to dampen all interest in the space one inhabits. Most modern office buildings have hermetically sealed windows. The air is processed, the temperature regulated. It is always the same. The body's largest sense organ, the skin, feels no wind, no changes in temperature, and is dulled. Muzak homogenizes the sound environment. Some buildings even use white noise, a deliberate mix of electronic sounds that merge into a hum. Seemingly innocuous, it fills the ears with an even background tone, obscuring random noises or passing conversations which might arouse interest or create a diversion. The light remains constant from morning through night, from room to room, until our awareness of light is as dulled as our awareness of temperature, <coughs> and we are not aware of the passage of time. We are told that a constant level of light is good for our eyes, that it relieves strain. Is this true? What about the loss of a range of focus, and the many changes in direction and intensity of light that our flexible eyes are designed to accommodate? Those who build artificial environments view the senses as single, monolithic things, rather than abilities that have a range of capacity for a reason. We know, for example, that our eyes can see from the extremely dark to the extremely bright, from far to near, from distinct to indistinct, from obvious to subtle. They perceive objects moving quickly and those that are still. The eye is a wonderfully flexible organ, able to adjust instantly to a dazzling array of information, constantly changing, multi-leveled, perceiving objects far and near, moving at different speeds simultaneously. A fully functioning visual capacity is equal to everything the natural environment offers as visual information. This would have to be so, since the interaction between the senses and the natural environment created the range of abilities that we needed to have. Sight did not just arrive one day, like Adam's rib. It co-evolved with the ingredients around it which it was designed to see. When our eyes are constantly exercised, when flexibility and dynamism are encouraged, then they are equal to the variety of stimuli that night and day have to offer. It's probably not wise always to have good light, or to be for very long at fixed distances from anything. The result will be a, a lack of exercise and eventual atrophy of our, the eyes' abilities. When we reduce an aspect of environment from varied and multidimensional to fixed, we also change the human being who lives within it. Humans give up the capacity to adjust, just as the person who only walks cannot so easily handle the experience of running. The lungs, the heart, and other muscles have not been exercised. The human being then becomes a creature with a narrower range of abilities and fewer feelings about the loss. We become grosser, simpler, less varied, like the environment. The common response to this is that if we lose wide-spectrum sensory experience, we gain a deeper mental experience. This is not true. We only have less non-mental experience, so the mental life seems richer by comparison. In fact, mental life is more enriched by a fully functioning sensory life. In recent years, researchers have discovered some amazing things about the connections between mental and physical life by doing sensory deprivation experiments. In such experiments, a human subject is cut off from as much sensory information as possible. This can be accomplished, for example, by a totally blank environment. White walls, no furniture, no sounds, constant temperature, constant light, no food, and no windows. A more thorough method is to put the blindfolded subject inside a temperature-controlled suit floating in a water tank with only tubes to provide air and water, which are also at body temperature. This sensory deprivation tank eliminates the tactile sense as well as an awareness of up and down. Researchers have found that when sensory stimuli are suppressed this way, the subject at first lives a mental life because mental images are the only stimulation. But after a while these images become disoriented and can be frightening. Disconnected from the world outside the mind, the subject is rootless and ungrounded. If the experience goes on long enough, 
a kind of madness develops which can be allayed only by reintroducing sensory stimuli, direct contact with the world outside the subject's mind. <coughs> Before total disorientation occurs, a second effect takes place. That is a dramatic increase in focus on any stimulus at all that is introduced. In such a deprived environment, one single stimulus acquires extraordinary power and importance. In the most literal sense, the subject loses perspective and cannot put the stimulus in context. Such experiments have proven to be effective in halting heavy smoking habits, for example, when the experimenter speaks instructions to stop smoking or describes to the subject through a microphone the harmful, unpleasant aspects of smoking. These experiments have shown that volunteers can be programmed to believe and to do things they would not have done in a fully functional condition. The technique could be called brainwashing. It would be going too far to call our modern offices sensory deprivation chambers, but they are most certainly sensory reduction chambers. They may not brainwash, but the elimination of sensory stimuli definitely increases focus on the task at hand, the work to be done to the exclusion of all else. Modern offices were designed for that very purpose by people who knew what they were doing. If people's senses were stimulated to experience anything approaching their potential range, it would be highly unlikely that people would sit for eight long hours at desks reading memoranda, typing documents, studying columns of figures, or pondering sales strategies. If birds were flying through the room and wind were blowing the papers about, if the sun were shining in there, or people were lolling about on chaise lounges or taking baths while listening to various musical presentations, this would certainly divert the office worker from the mental work he or she is there to do. In fact, if offices were so arranged, little business would get done. This is why they are not so arranged. Any awareness of the senses, aside from their singular uses in reading and sometimes talking and listening, would be disastrous for office environments that require people to stay focused within narrow and specific functional modes. Feeling is also discouraged by these environments. Reducing sensual variations is one good way of reducing feeling since the one stimulates the other. But there is also a hierarchy of values which further the process. Objectivity is the highest value that can be exhibited by an ex executive in an office. Orderliness is the highest value for a subordinate office worker. Both of these are most easily achieved if the human is effectively disconnected from the distractions of her or his senses, feelings, and intuitions. <coughs> With the field of experience so drastically reduced for office workers, the stimuli which remain, paperwork, mental work, business, loom larger and obtain an importance they would not have in a wider, more varied, more stimulating environment. The worker gets interested in them largely because that is what is available to get interested in. Curiously, however, while eschewing feeling and intuition, business people often cannot resist using them. They come out as aberrations, fierce competitive drive, rage at small inconveniences, decisions that do not fit the models of objectivity. Such behavior in business sometimes make me think of blades of grass growing upward through the pavement. A more poignant example, perhaps, is that modern offices have proven to be such hot sexual environments. Aside from the occasional potted plant, the only creatures in offices with which it is possible to experience anything are other humans. With all other organic life absent, and, the senses, and with the senses deprived of most possibilities for human experience, the occasional body which passes the desk becomes an especially potent sensual event, the only way out of the condition of suspended experience, and the only way to experience oneself as alive. In fact, the confinement of human beings within artificial environments may be a partial explanation of our new culture-wide obsession with and focus on sex. I've been speaking mainly of cities. This has only been because their effects are most obvious. I don't want to create the impression that suburbs, retirement communities, recreational communities, and the like offer any greater access to a wider range of experience. Those places do have large trees, for example, and more small animals. The sky is more visible, without giant buildings to alter the view. But in most ways, suburban-type environments reveal less of natural processes than cities do. Cities, at least, offer a critical ingredient of the natural world, diversity, albeit a diversity that is confined to only human life forms. 
it does not nearly approach the complexity of an acre of an ordinary forest. In suburbs, the totality of experience is plotted in advance and then marketed on the basis of the plan. We will have everything to serve the recreational needs of your family. Playgrounds, ball fields, golf course, tennis courts, bowling alleys, and picnic grounds. This, plus a front lawn, a back lawn, two large trees, and an attentive police force makes up the total package. Human beings then live inside that package. Places formerly as diverse as forest, desert, marsh, plain, and mountain have been unified into suburban tracts. The human senses, seeking outward for knowledge and stimulation, find only what has been prearranged by other humans. In many ways, the same can be said of rural environments. Land which once supported hundreds of varieties of plant and animal life has been transformed by agribusinesses. Insect life has been largely eliminated by massive spraying. For hundreds of square miles, the only living things are artichokes or tomatoes laid out in straight rows. The child seeking to know how nature works finds only spray planes, automated threshers, and miles of rows of a single crop. Rooms inside rooms. There are differences of opinion about what the critical moments were that led human beings away from the primary forms of experience, between person and planet, into secondary mediated environments. Some go back as far as the control of fire, the domestication of animals, the invention of agriculture, or the imposition of monotheism and patriarchy. In my opinion, however, the most significant recent moment came with the control of electricity for power about four generations ago. This made it possible to begin moving nearly all human functions indoors, and made the outdoors more like indoors. In less than four generations out of an estimated 100,000, we have fundamentally changed the nature of our interaction with the planet. Our environment no longer grows on its own, by its own design, in its own time. The environment in which we live has been totally reconstructed solely by human intention and creation. We find ourselves living inside a kind of nationwide room. We look around it and see only our own creations. We go through life believing we are experiencing the world when actually our experiences are confined within entirely human conceptions. Our world has been thought up. Our environment itself is the manifestation of the mental processes of other humans. Of all the species of the planet and all the cultures of the human species, we 20th century Americans have become the first in history to live predominantly inside projections of our own minds. <coughs> we live in a kind of maelstrom, going ever deeper into our own thought processes, into subterranean caverns, where non-human reality is up, up, away somewhere. We are within a system of ev ever smaller, ever deeper concentric circles, and we consider each new depth that we reach greater progress and greater knowledge. Our environment itself becomes an editor, filter and medium between ourselves and an alternative, non-human, unedited, organic, planetary reality. We ask the child to understand nature and care about it, to know the difference between what humans create and what the planet does. But how can the child know these things? The child lives with us in a room inside a room inside another room. The child sees an apple in a store and assumes that the apple and the store are organically connected. The child sees streets, buildings, and a mountain and assumes it was all put there by humans. How can the child assume otherwise? That is the obvious conclusion of the world in which all reality is created by humans. As adults, we assume we are not so vulnerable to this mistake, that we are educated and our minds can save us. We know the difference between natural and artificial. And yet, we have no greater contact with the wider world than the child has. Most people still give little importance to any of this. Those who take note of these changes usually speak of them in esoteric, aesthetic, or philosophical terms. It takes good discussion of parties, it makes good discussion of parties in philosophy classes. As we go, however, I hope it will become apparent that the most compelling outcome of these sudden changes in the way we experience life is the inevitable political one. Living within artificial, reconstructed, arbitrary environments that are strictly the products of human conception, we have no way to be sure that we know what is true and what is not. We have lost context and perspective. What we know is what other humans tell us. Therefore, whoever controls the processes of recreation effectively redefines reality for everyone else and creates the entire world of human experience, our field of knowledge. We become subject to them. 
the confinement of our experience becomes the basis of their control of us. The role of the media in all this is to confirm the validity of the arbitrary world in which we live. The role of television is to project that world via images into our heads, all of us at the same time. <coughs> 4. Expropriation of Knowledge At the moment when the natural environment was altered beyond the point that it could be personally observed, the definitions of knowledge itself began to change. No longer based on direct experience, knowledge began to depend upon scientific, technological, industrial proof. Scientists, technologists, psychologists, industrialists, economists, and the media which translate and disseminate their findings and opinions become our source. Now they tell us what nature is, what we are, how we relate to the cosmos, what we need for survival and happiness, and what are the appropriate ways to organize our existence. There is little wonder, therefore, that we should begin to doubt the evidence of our own experience and begin to be blind to the self-evident. Our experience is not valid until science says it is. Mother's milk is healthy. It is also of little wonder that we feel removed from participation in most of the larger issues which shape our lives. We feel removed because we are removed. As we continue to separate ourselves from direct experience of the planet, the hierarchy of techno-scientism advances. This creates astounding problems for a society that is supposed to be de democratic. In democracies, by definition, all human beings should have a say about technological developments that may profoundly change, even threaten, their lives. Nuclear power, genetic engineering, the spread of microwave systems, the advance of satellite communications, and the ubiquitous use of computers, to name only a few. And yet, in order to participate fully in discussions of the implications of these technologies, one must have training in at least physics, psychology, biology, philosophy, economics, and social and political theory. Any of these technologies has profound influence in all those areas. Because most of us are not so trained, all discussion takes place among our unelected surrogates, professionals, and experts. They don't have this full range of training either, but they do have access to one or another area of it and can speak to each other in techno-jargon, trade-offs, cost-benefits, resource management, and they therefore get to argue with each other over one side of the question or the, whole, or the other while the rest of us watch. <coughs> that their technological training and the language they use excludes from their frame of reference a broader, more subtle system of information and values rarely seems to occur to them. The alternative to leaving all discussion to the experts would be to take another route entirely. That would be to define a line beyond which democratic control, which is to say full participation of the populace in the details of decisions that affect all of us, is not possible. And then to say that anything which crosses this line is taboo. Yet the notion of taboo itself is itself taboo in our society, and the idea of outlawing whole technologies is virtually unthinkable. San Francisco ecologist Gil Bailey, in a brilliant article in the 1975 edition of Planet Drum, argues that taboo systems of earlier cultures were not quite the darkly irrational frameworks we now believe them to have been. Most often, they reflected knowledge taken from nature and then modified by human experience over time. Their purpose was to articulate and preserve natural balances in a given area or within a given group of people at a particular time. They were statements about when too far is too far. This sensitivity to natural balances, which was the basis of virtually every culture before our own, has now been suppressed by our modern belief that science and technology can solve all problems and that therefore all technologies which can be created ought to be. The question of natural balance is now subordinated. Evolution is defined less in terms of planetary process than technological process. The planet and its information are now considered less relevant than human ingenuity, an idiotic and dangerous error shielded from exposure only by the walls of previous assumption and the concrete of the physical forms within which we live. <coughs> Ivan Illich, a leading critic of the expropriation of knowledge into a netherworld of experts and abstraction, argues in Medical Nemesis that professional medicine may be causing more harm than good. We go to doctors as we go to mechanics. They speak a language that remains impenetrable to us. We take their cures on faith. Illich remarks that this may be producing more illness than cure. It has separated people from knowledge about keeping themselves happy, healthy, 
a knowledge that was once ingrained in the culture. Although some of our techno-scientific methods work, some do not, and the doctors who use them may not understand them or may be inexpert in their use. The doctors, Illich believes, are also taking the validity of techno-medicine on faith. Their source is usually the chemical and drug industry, which has a stake in disrupting natural healing methods. How else could they sell their chemicals? Direct education. As a child, I wondered how human beings learned which plants were edible and which were not. How did our ancestors learn about poisons or cures for poisons without any doctors around? <coughs> I assumed it was trial and error because that was the way it was explained to me. A group of cave people or Indians came upon a new plant. One of them tasted it and killed they were dead. That's how they knew not to eat that plant again. Doubtless this was one method, but from what I can gather, this taste method was not the primary means for acquiring this knowledge. It certainly could not account for the finely detailed knowledge Indians have of plants. How is an Indian to know that eating juniper berries would make one's liver function better, one's skin color change, and one's energy increase? None of these effects could be immediately apparent. The effects might take days or weeks or longer, and yet they knew it. Writing in the winter 1975 edition of Indigena, a Brazilian Indian woman, Carmen de Nove, reports that the Indian people of the Amazon jungle have been able to identify, locate, and use plants for curing specific ailments as well as for arrow poisons and fish stunning substances. While Western science has not yet arrived at a chemical contraceptive that does not harm women, she says, the Amazon people have been using medicinal plants as a successful contraceptive method for many thousands of years. The medicines developed and produced through modern technology are usually extracted from medicinal herbs and plants. The major sources of information about plants and their medicinal uses are the people who live in harmony and very close to the cycles of Mother Earth. <coughs> the drug companies would take many years if they were to research all the plants by themselves in an attempt to discover their medicinal uses. De Navai mentions Indian medicines such as coca, ipecac, quinine, curare, among others, and traces how some of these led to anesthetics such as procaine and novocaine, and to cures for amoebic dysentery, malaria, heart disease, and poisons, and to treatments for nerve disorders, epilepsy, and others. All of these were first used by Indians. The drug companies secure an adequate supply of the basic plant material, sometimes buying off Indian land for production, and sell the drugs derived from these plants to the world and to the people who first told them about them as well, do you know that wrotes, notes? <coughs> they make great profits from their discoveries without any monetary reward to the Indians from which they acquired their drug secret. Quite the opposite, in fact. By taking over the land and turning the Indians into laborers while introducing the money system and imposing Western-style medicine, the drug companies put the Indians in the position of having to buy the medicines they formerly had in abundance. The question remains, how did the Indians know about the curative powers of, of plants in the first place? While researching the portion of this book that deals with the consequences of humans ingesting as much artificial light as we do now, particularly television light, I came upon an odd report in the New England Journal of Medicine. A team of doctors discovered that infant jaundice could be cured by ordinary sunlight. This discovery led to a spurt of articles on the possibility that natural light might be healthy for humans. What a revelation! The doctors had undertaken their study of the effects of sunlight on jaundiced infants when a day nurse remarked that the infants near the open window were improving faster than those who were away from it. Then, while working on the study, someone discovered that over 7,000 years ago, Egyptians treated jaundiced infants by placing them in the sunlight and feeding them an herb that had a beneficial interaction with the sun's rays. The article did not ask, but I couldn't help wondering how the Egyptians, stranded back there in time, discovered this important effect of sunlight and herb on jaundice without grants from the National Science Foundation. <coughs> One explanation for the knowledge of earlier cultures, expounded by such people as the popular German writer Erich von Däniken, is that humans, white with red hair, had arrived from outer space and taught the ignorant savages everything they knew. This kind of explanation, aside from its implicit racism and its entertainment value, is an indication of how far we all are from understanding knowledge systems that are based on direct experience. 
Recently I had the chance to see some time-lapse films of plants by Dr. John Ott. Time-lapse photography makes it possible to see plants moving. It reveals them constantly straining for light like baby birds with their mouths open. Tendrils climb, crawl, and wave around. Stems swell, inflate, then relax like an inhaling and exhaling lung. Plants vibrate and pulsate in response to the immediate condition of their environment. In one particular sequence, passion flowers blossomed in an excruciating process of slowly mounting intensity. The bud began to turn into a flower, the petals took form and slowly burst out from the bud that contained them. Suddenly there was another burst of energy as the petals released themselves upward, stretching and straining every tiny tip, exhibiting a fullness of expression clearly analogous to orgasm and what even looked like plant pleasure. <coughs> From this perspective, it is obvious that plants are alive in more or less the way humans and other animals are. Our failure to see plants as living creatures and to appreciate ourselves as some kind of sped-up plant is the result of limited human perception, a sign of the boundaries of our senses, or the degree to which we have allowed them to atrophy, or the fact that, it would become, that we have become too speedy to perceive the slower rhythms of other life forms. It is a cliché among naturalists that the most critical ingredient of their work is patience. The researcher has to slow down sufficiently to wait and wait and watch until cycles of activity which were previously invisible become visible. The longer one waits and the slower one's rhythms, the more one is able to perceive the tiny details of natural growth. Pre-technological peoples do not have to go through a slowing down process. Surrounded by nature, with everything alive everywhere around them, they develop an automatic intimacy with the natural world. Beyond intimacy, there is the sense that events of the forest or desert are not actually separate from oneself, that humans are just part of a larger living creature, the planet. This was not merely a way of speaking for Indian peoples, it was a definite fact. They meant it and would give evidence of it. Things that grow are put into our bodies so that we grow. The air goes into us and out. The water goes through us. Warm air outside warms us inside and vice versa. We can imagine that we are not connected to things in this way only when our connections are blocked, altered, or stunted. For Indian people, the plants, weather, terrain, soil, water, and their interactions were part of the body of which they themselves were also a part. They experienced these natural forces as they did themselves. <coughs> In Wizard of the Upper Amazon, F. Bruce Lamb records the apparently true account of Manuel Cordova de Rios, a Peruvian rubber cutter, kidnapped by the Amahueca Indians for invading their territory and forced to remain with them for many years. Rios describes the way the Indians learn things about the jungle, which is both the object of constant study and the teacher. They observed it first as in individuals experiencing each detail. Then they worked out larger patterns together as a group, much like individual cells informing the larger body, which also informs the cells. In the evenings, the whole tribe would gather and repeat each detail of the day just passed. They would describe every sound, the creature that made it, and its apparent state of mind. The conditions of growth of all the plants for miles around were discussed. This band of howler monkeys, which was over here three days ago, is now over there. Certain fruit trees, which were in the bud stage three weeks ago, are now bearing ripe fruit. A jaguar was seen near the river, and now it is on the hillside. It is in a strangely anguished mood. The grasses in the valley are peculiarly dry. There is a group of birds that have not moved for several days. The wind has altered in direction and smells of something unknown. Actually, actually such a fact as a wind change might not be reported at all everyone would already know it. A change of wind or scent would arrive in everyone's awareness as a bucket of cold water thrown on the head might arrive in ours. Rios tells many of the Indian stories concerned with personalities of individual animals and plants, what kinds of vibrations they give off. <coughs> Dreams acted as additional information systems from beyond the level of conscious notation, drawing up patterns and meanings from deeper levels. Predictions would be based on them. Drugs were used not so much for changing moods as we use them today, but for the purpose of further spacing out perception. Plants and animals could then be seen more clearly as if in slow motion, time-lapse, 
adding to the powers of observation, yielding up especially subtle information as to how plants worked and which creatures would be more likely to relate to which plants. An animal interested in concealment, for example, might eat a plant which tended to conceal itself. Reading these accounts made it clear to me that all life in the jungle is constantly aware of all other life in exquisite detail. Through all this, the Indians gained information about the way natural systems interact. The observation was itself knowledge. Depending on the interpretation, the knowledge might or might not become reliable and useful. Each detail of each event had special power and meaning, understood as part of a larger pattern of activities and forces. The understanding was so complete that it was only the rare event that could not be explained. A twig cracked in a way that did not fit the previous history of cracked twigs. That was cause for concern and immediate arming. <coughs> Rios recounted the way the Indians would capture and kill pigs. They knew that the pigs were led by a single sow, and that they walked through the forest in a very widely dispersed but specific fanned out pattern behind the lead sow, much as birds fly through the air in formation. The Indians knew that killing the lead sow would throw the others into a state of confusion while they worked out who the new lead sow would be. During the confusions, the Indians would kill a few pigs, being careful not to kill any emerging leaders. Instead, they would allow the new lead sow to emerge and lead the surviving band out of danger. Then they would take the dead leader and cut off her head. They would plant the head just below the surface of the ground, facing in a specific direction exactly. If they did this just so, the entire band would return to that exact spot in precisely three moons. If they erred in any minute detail of the procedure, the band would not return and the Indians would have to hunt for a new band. Rios saw this work many times. No one ever asked why it worked so well. The knowledge of it was merely passed down, generation to generation, and there was always plenty of pig to eat. <coughs> Many books written by Indian people describe another method by which knowledge of plants and animals could be amplified and integrated into the observer directly, physically, emulation. By imitating a creature, getting inside it, one learns to understand it better. A person imitates a plant's stance and movements, its behavioral characteristics, in order to be as it is, to integrate its mood and character into herself or himself. This is often done tribally or personally in dances and ceremonies, and includes not only plants and animals, but also the attitudes of wind, rain, and other people. Indian literature, as well as the literature, what we call myth, of pre-technological people, including our own European ancestors, is filled with stories of humans turning into wolves, bears, birds, snakes, or insects in order to circumvent some otherwise insurmountable difficulty by using the knowledge of the appropriate creature. If stealth were the capacity human beings needed, a way of gaining knowledge of stealth would be to observe stealthy creatures, panthers for example, and then imitate them. If instant strike from repose was desired as a protective ability, then the cobra was a good model. If calmness and flow were sought, observe streams. If airiness or lightness were wanted, imitate the butterfly. <clears throat> Indians do not name people after particular creatures from some kind of charming aesthetic sense. Many white buffalo, crazy horse, sitting bull. The animals and natural elements that were part of the names had concrete observable characteristics. Strength, constancy, agility, slyness, fierceness, and so on. Nature was not only a metaphor for human behavior, nature was literally a teacher. The way animals solve problems, or the way they moved or otherwise behaved, became the model for human behavior. Even today, imitation and emulation inform human behavior. We read that Muhammad Ali says, I dance like a butterfly, sting like a bee. By using such phrases, he mentally associates his own movements with those of the creatures. While he cannot behave exactly as they can, he does probably succeed in integrating some creaturely movement into himself. Of course, if, it, if he had never seen a butterfly or a bee, he could not learn anything from them. The imitative process is automatic with children. They imitate whatever is around. Parents, cats, dogs, insects, plants, cars, each other. And whatever images are delivered through the media. 
Of course, imitating the animal seen in the media image is not the same as imitating the animal seen in the forest. To achieve their exquisitely detailed knowledge of the world around them, human beings living in non-mediated environments had to use all their abilities to observe themselves, the planet, and the things that grow from it. They might ha not have even considered the planet to be something that was actually outside them, since their senses told them it was also inside them. <coughs> their world was organized along flow lines, not in separate and distinct boxes. Knowledge results from personal experience and direct observation, seeing, hearing, touching, tasting, and smelling. These are aided by several inward systems. There is instinct, for example, gathered by innumerable previous generations and carried forward in the cells. There is intuition, what Eastern religions call knowing without seeing. In addition, there are feelings, which may have been informed by prior experience. All of these, the five senses plus instinct, intuition, feeling, and thought, combine to produce conscious awareness, the ability to perceive and describe the way the world is organized. Western people like to think of these human qualities as separate from one another, and some as more real than others. Yet all of the abilities interact both between person and planet, and among each other. One sense interacts with another sense, the senses interact with feelings, intuition functions together with instinct, thought flows constantly in and out of all experience. The fully functional human being can be understood as a kind of microcosmic ecosystem inside a wider ecosystem inside a wider one, and so on. All systems flowing in and out of each other. As with other systems, when one thing is altered, the overall balance is altered. Changes in one aspect of human perception or experience affect all others. When a person has all senses fully operative, we call the person sensitive. People who live in environments that stimulate the full sensory range from the most subtle to the most obvious are more sensitive than those who don't. The senses developed in interaction with the multiple patterns and influences of the natural environment. No sensual capacity was developed by accident. No sense maintains itself if it is not used. If its sense remains unused, it atrophies. In 1969, my wife and I visited several of the small islands that make up the larger area that colonists named Micronesia. <coughs> Most of these islands are so small and so remote, hundreds of miles from each other, that many of their native cultures remain largely intact, although there is an increasing U.S. military and business presence there. On one island, we met a man who had a small motorboat. He had been to school in Hawaii, had lived in Los Angeles for a time, and spoke good English. He offered to take us for a ride into the ocean to visit some tiny islands he knew about. This required taking one of two routes past the coral reef that surrounded the island. He gave us a choice. One route took many hours to where there was a break in the reef. The other way, he told us, was to follow the pattern of the waves until they are organized just so. Then he would leap the reef with the boat. We decided to go along with him in this latter route. When we got to the island, he succeeded in spearing a few fish. We built a small fire, and he threw the fish directly into the flames. After a few minutes, he reached into the fire with his hands and turned them over. I asked him if reaching into the fire like that didn't hurt. He answered, it hurts a little bit. We were becoming more interested in this man. Then he started talking about the reef, a favorite subject. We asked him why he walked around on the reef with bare feet, when we had been warned always to wear thick-soled sneakers because of a poisonous starfish that can deliver a painful and sometimes paralyzing wound. He then told us words to this effect. Yes, but if you step on one, all you have to do is pick it up, turn it over, and place its underside directly on your wound. It will suck its own poison back out of you. We asked him how he knew that, and he said, Everybody around here knows that. Whenever there is something poisonous, its antidote is never more than a few yards away. Everybody knows this. It's the same everywhere. <coughs> we asked him about his life during those years in the big cities of the world, and his story was like any story of any Indian who leaves them to participate in the life of the developed world. It was about fights, miserable jobs, jail, and drunkenness. Detailed knowledge of wind, rain, sun, and stars only got in his way. It would have been far better for survival in our world to suppress these observations and develop mental agility, persuasiveness, charm, guile, and aggression. Naively, we ask why he chose to sacrifice his island life for cities, and for this he had no answer except to say that his own response to cars and machines reminded him of the way the fish becomes stunned by the glint of the diver's metal face mask. At last he had come back to the island, where he remained hoisted between cultures. Motel Education 
1974, I was one of 30 leading environmental educators invited to attend a conference at Ann Arbor, Michigan, jointly sponsored by the Environmental Education Program of the School of Natural Resources at the University of Mich Michigan and the Division of Technology and Environmental Education of the U.S. Department of Health, Education, and Welfare. <coughs> the goal of this conference was to provide guidelines to the government on how to grant money for environmental education projects. We 30 people would decide what is good and effective environmental education and what is not. We had four days to do this. I arrived to discover that the meeting place was a motel outside of Ann Arbor, sandwiched sandwich between two freeways. If we wished to go anywhere, we had to do so by car. The rooms we slept in had windows which did not open. They offered 24-hour air conditioning or heating. The rooms in which the meetings themselves were held had no windows at all. The light was fluorescent. The motel had a swimming pool under a glass roof. Artificial palm trees were arranged around the pool area. The glass roof did not open, but there were lounge chairs here and there and portable sun lamps on wheels. The talk of the conference was in techno newspeak. We spoke of educational delivery systems, value trade-offs, checklists, guidelines, needs assessments, target groups, cost-effectiveness, impact strategies, and of course my specialty, education of and through the media. During the second day of the conference, a small group of the participants interrupted the proceedings to point out that we were all receiving an environmental education directly from our environment of windowless rooms, blank walls, and fluorescent lights. While we spoke of teaching others about an organic environment out there somewhere, the artificial environment that we were in was teaching us that nature was irrelevant, separate from us, and of only intellectual value. The natural environment, if it existed for us anywhere, was only in our minds, in our memories. Our failure to recognize that this was important signified that a widespread aberration of mind had proceeded further than we preferred to believe. It was useless for us to speak of making other people sensitive to environmental values when we, a group of so-called leaders, were satisfied with an environment which totally excluded the organic environment and did not even notice that condition. A biologist in her 60s stood up and gave an impromptu lecture, pointing out that a serious distortion had taken place in the very concept of education, and that we were all examples of it. I will paraphrase what she said. There are objective educational processes in which rational modes operate. Reading a textbook certainly does transmit a kind of knowledge, but there are also subjective informational receptive modes. Walking through forests is different from attending classes on forests because each offers information of an entirely different sort. Classes on forests can never help us relate to forests or to care about them at all. Only being in one can accomplish that, just as the only way to know what dancing is, is about is to dance. When we are inside these motel walls, we begin to think the natural world has nothing to teach us. We environmentalists suffer the same distorted notion of education that all Western people do. We think of education as objective, quantifiable, and verbal. Our own words become our basis. As a result, we don't have a sense of the rightness or wrongness of each new technological wonder. We hear about a green revolution which will feed the starving millions and we buy the expert's word, just as everyone else does. Without any experience with natural balance, we forget that things grow only so fast. If you accelerate the process artificially, something is lost. We read studies by scientists which say that the ozone layer is safe despite aerosols, and we read other studies by scientists which say the ozone layer is in danger. We wonder which is true, which scientists are correct. But this wondering signifies that we have sold out our instinctive knowledge. Obviously, any artificial alteration of the ozone layer changes the volume of radiation which reaches the planet and is harmful. We read that the whales are beaching themselves and we wonder why. Scientists tell us that the leader whale may have parasites in its brain, goes crazy, and leads the others to the beach. Millions of people read this story and find it logical because their knowledge of whales is confined to the length, weight, mating habits, breeding grounds, commercial uses, and optimum sustainable yield. And yet the Solomon Islanders have long descriptions of whales and dolphins beaching themselves every year for thousands of years. The Islanders say it is a human-animal communications ritual, part of the cycle which is obscure to us. I don't know if they are right either. <clears throat> I do know that whales don't have leaders, they operate in groups, and given their brain size, they are probably the most intelligent mammals on Earth. I don't believe it's a parasite problem. 
She concluded by saying that we have put all of our eggs into a single basket. We have assumed that empirical knowledge, empirical objectified processes produce knowledge equal to what the environment offers as information. We have assumed our knowledge is growing. I'm not so sure. Her speech was received with polite interest. <coughs> there was general agreement that her statement was both moving and inspired. She was a grand old lady. But there was also considerable embarrassment at the silliness and romanticism of the idea that the environment, whether windowless walls or rivers, itself teaches. Teachers teach. Education is cerebral, not sensory. It was our role to help the teachers know what to teach. We were the ones who know. Participants agreed it would have been better if the conference had been at a location nearer to nature. It would have been more pleasant that way. That's what nature is, pleasant. But as long as we were here on this important mission, we might just as well get on with the work and cease with the diversions. One year later, I received a 548-page bound volume called An Instrument, which summarized the emerging issues in environmental education with details of the findings of the experts at this landmark meeting. The instrument was submitted to the Office of Environmental Education, which, for all I know, may still be using it today. If so, then I suppose we all will have furthered the process of moving knowledge away from natural sources and deeper into the realm of the expert. This, in turn, makes it easier for government and industry to expropriate it, alter it, and feed it back to us through the media and techno-jargon explicable only to techno-minds. With nature obscured, nearly everything we know comes to us processed, and it may be right or it may be wrong. We know only what we're told. For most of us, the TV news is now our source. Without any basis of comparison, as the news report changes, our understanding changes. Mother's milk is unsanitary. Mice like cheese. Mars has life on it. Technology will cure cancer. The stars do not influence us. Nuclear power is safe. Nuclear power is not safe. <coughs> Mars has no life on it. Food dyes are safe. Saccharin is safe. Technology causes cancer. Columbus proved the world was around. <coughs> a little x-ray is okay. The Vietnam War was not a civil war. We will have an epidemic of swine flu. Mother's milk is healthy. Technology will clean up pollution. Preservatives do not cause cancer. Economic growth is in the offing. Red food dyes are not safe. Swine flu vaccine is safe. The Vietnam War was a civil war. Hierarchy is natural. Humans are the royalty of nature. Saccharin is not safe. Swine flu vaccine causes paralysis. We have the highest standard of living. Hormones and beef cause cancer. Touching children is good for them. Too much sun causes cancer. And so it goes. 5. Adrift in Mental Space Many people who experiment with mind-manifesting drugs report that while under the influence they begin to see the world, especially the human-made technological forms that dominate cities, as absurd and alien. People who take LSD commonly freak out in the presence of heavy traffic, sterile environments, abrasive sounds, or mechanical things and smells. They often describe these experiences of everyday life as unreal. It is part of the LSD literature that bad trips are more likely to occur in urban than in natural environments. Setting is critically important. People are urged to keep objects around from which they gain feelings of comfort, to play music which has been familiar and friendly in the past, or to have close friends nearby and to stay in physical contact with them. Hugging is highly recommended if the friend is deeply trusted, so are warm baths and personal conversation. These elements can accomplish what is called grounding, meaning contact which is undeniably real, not abstract, not interpreted, not artificial, not open to question. The radical psychiatrist R.D. Lang, among others, has said that the growing incidence of mental illness these days may be explained in part by the fact that the world we call real, and which we ask people to live within and understand, is itself open to question. The environment we live in is no longer connected to the mix of planetary processes which brought us all into being. It is solely the product of human mental processes. It is real, but only in the way that a theatrical play or a funhouse is real. Our artificial environment is there and we can experience it, yet it has been created on purpose by other humans. It is an interpretation of reality, <clears throat> it no longer reveals how nature works, and it cannot provide much useful information to human beings who seek to see their own lives as part of some wider natural process. 
we are left with no frame of reference untouched by human interpretation. Living within this environment ultimately foists upon us a bizarre choice between two equally disconnected realities. We may decide to accept as real our artificially reconstructed human environment, ignoring that it is an arbitrary recreation, and accepting this interpretation of reality as our own. Or we may recoil from it, allowing ourselves to see our new environment as a stage set or a series of false fronts. This is the way that schizophrenic often describes the world. Those who make the latter choice risk the dangers inherent in trying to understand the world solely through their own isolated internal mental processes. Either choice, acceptance or rejection, separates us from the possibility of interacting with and learning from the organic reality which exists outside of human conception. But what we call sanity lies in the first choice, acceptance of the arbitrary as real. Lang proposes, therefore, that the schizophrenic of today is not suffering a psychological problem with a personal cause so much as he or she is making an apt response to a true condition of the modern world that has a political or technological cause. The so-called sane are holding on by our teeth to an extremely flimsy and arbitrary framework of reality. Thus far, political theorists have failed to make very much of the effect our modern environment have on us. <clears throat> Failing to grasp that the physical world we live in is itself arbitrary and thereby likely to be confusing to masses of people who seek solid ground on which to stand, political observers have not made some critical deductions. Primary among these is that when people cannot distinguish with certainty the natural from the interpreted or the artificial from the organic, then all theories of the ideal organization of life become equal. None of them can be understood as any more or less connected to planetary truth, and so the person or forces capable of speaking most loudly or most forcefully, or with some apparent logic, even if it is an unrooted logic, can become convincing within the void of understanding. Where political theorists have overlooked these phenomena, others have not. Looking at today's worlds from the outside in, as it were, and extrapolating from here into the future, science fiction writers have often been politically visionary. In their analyses and use of the relationships between artificial environments, high technology, sanity, and insanity, and therefore the inevitability of more accurately the fact of human mind control, some science fiction writers <coughs> produce work that merges with political criticism. <coughs> A second category of people who have noticed the modern human relationships with the environment is the leadership of the new popular philosophical religious movements such as Scientology, Est, Erica, Mind Dynamics, and others. Unfortunately, these leaders do not warn us of the consequences of the confusion, but instead take advantage of it. Noting that reality and its definitions have now entered the realm of game and are up for grabs, they become better at the game than anyone else, exploiting it, reshaping disordered, uprooted minds, and tilling a new bed of mental soil from which monsters will inevitably grow. By looking at science fiction and the new philosophical religious movements, we can develop a model which may indicate the likely result of the technological processes that are already very far along in our world. Science Fiction and Arbitrary Reality A widely misunderstood Soviet film, Solaris, directed by Andrei Tarkovsky from the book by Stanislav Lem, depicts problems faced by some astronauts in a space station that is orbiting the planet Solaris in a faraway galaxy. Of an original group of 85 astronauts, only two are left. Most have fled, others have gone and been sh gone mad and been shipped back to Earth. Several have killed themselves. The surface of Solaris is one vast ocean, which is also a single living mind. This planet ocean mind is playing some kind of awful mental trick on its visitors. Back on Earth, puzzled space officials send a psychologist, Chris Kelvin, to investigate. Before leaving the planet for outer space, Kelvin spends his final weeks visiting his father in a small house deep in some woods. He immerses himself in the forest and takes long, silent walks through meadows. The film moves exceedingly slowly at this point. There are long s sequences in which nothing but natural events of the forest pass by the camera lens. Nature time. Sometimes the camera follows Kelvin's eyes as they absorb the surroundings. It rains. He is soaked. Back at his cabin, his body is warmed by a fire. Finally, it is time to leave. Now the camera is in the front seat of the car, sitting where Kelvin is seated. We see what he sees. Slowly the terrain changes. 
winding wooded roads give way to straight one-lane roads. The foliage recedes from the highway. Then we are on a freeway. The environment has become speeding cars, overpasses, underpasses, tunnels. Soon we are in a city. There is noise, light, buildings everywhere. The natural landscape is submerged, invisible. Homocentric landscapes, abstract reality prevail. From there, it's a fast cut to space. <coughs> Kelvin is alone in a small space vehicle, heading towards Solaris. Earth is gone. His roots have been abandoned. Grounding, by definition, is impossible. His whole environment is abstract. His planetary home now exists only in memory. Arriving at the space station, Kelvin understands Solaris's trick. It enters visitors' memories and then creates real-life manifestations of them. This begins to happen to Kelvin. His long-dead wife appears in his room. First he believes it is an image of her, then he realizes it is not just an image, it is actually she. And yet they are both aware that she is only a manifestation of his mind, so she is simultaneously real and imaginary. Other people from Kelvin's life appear in the lab. He encounters the recreated memories of the other two astronauts. Relatives, old friends, toys, scraps of long-abandoned clothing, technical equipment, potted plants, dogs, dwarfs from a childhood circus, fields of grass. Things are strewn wildly about us as the visitors from Earth try to figure out what to do with all the real, unreal stuff that keeps appearing from their memories. The space station takes on the quality of a dream, a carnival, a lunatic asylum. <coughs> the scientists consider returning to Earth as the others have. Kelvin favors this move as he feels his sanity slipping, yet he realizes that it, to leave means killing his rediscovered wife. Back on Earth, she will be a memory much as Earth has become in this space station. She understands this and is a source of anguish for both of them. No one among the scientists or their mental creations can control what will happen. Without concrete reality, which is to say contact with their planetary roots, they are adrift in their minds, insane. All information has become believable and not believable at the same time. It has become arbitrary. There is no way to separate the real from the not real. Although the astronauts know this, since there is nothing that is not arbitrary except each other, all information is equal. It is impossible to determine which information to act on. Solaris has made the astronauts its subjects. They cannot defend themselves from the images the planet makes concrete. In the end, the men have no choice but to accept all information as real. Kelvin goes through a long cycle of Earth images from childhood to his present space station life. He is in his father's house again, but he is also in space. It rains again, but now the rain is indoors. It might as well be. He cannot distinguish. He accepts. <coughs> Finally, the message of the film is clear. The process of going insane began long before the launch into space. It began when life moved from nature into cities. Kelvin's ride from woods to city to space was a ride from connection to disconnection, from reality to abstraction, a history of technology, setting the conditions for the imposition of reconstructed realities by a single, powerful force. A generation ago, both George Orwell and Ellis Huxley wrote 20th century classics on the same theme. Both 1984 and Brave New World had been analyzed and reanalyzed, but with each turn of the technology screw, they take on new levels of meaning and relevance. In Orwell's 1984, the central technique of oppression is the absolute control of all kinds of information, both in the traditional sense, news, books, language, and also in the sense of information from the environment. A suffocatingly narrow language, newspeak, is imposed. It has no vocabulary to express many ideas and human feelings, and without expression, they begin to atrophy. Every room contains a television set which constantly floods people's minds with martial music, news of military achievements, and the despicable actions of the leader of the underground, Goldstein. <coughs> the past is completely eliminated. History is revised. Books are destroyed. Without print media, there is no evidence that anything has been different. Even keeping diaries is forbidden. People are expected to absorb and accept the new information delivered by the television sets, even if it directly contradicts the news of a month ago. Since it is impossible to prove the contradiction, it is useless to try to resist. Without points of comparison, all information is equally real. The underground, for example, or a distant war between Oceania and East Asia, might have existed or they might not have. There is no way of knowing. A critical element in 1984 that has been little observed by commentators is that the people are confined inside cities. For any visit to the natural landscape, which is itself the past, special permission is needed. 
Sex is illegal except for purposes of propagation. Pleasure is outlawed. In this way, Big Brother is able to enter and control people's experience of their internal nature as he controls their experience of the landscape. Humor, feelings, senses, and instincts are also part of the past. <clears throat> the effect of all this is to purge all references to any alternative. Whatever is offered as real can no longer be faulted. Nothing is provable by direct experience because all experience is manufactured. All existence becomes arbitrary, subject to the creation of Big Brother in the party, Orwell's Solaris. The party said that Oceana has never been in alliance with Eurasia. He, Winston Smith, knew that Oceana had been in alliance with Eurasia as short a time as four years ago. But where did that knowledge exist? Only in his own consciousness, which in any case must soon be annihilated. And if all others accept the lie which the party imposed, if all records told the same tale, then the lie passed into history and became truth. Who controls the past, ran the party slogan, controls the future. Who controls the present, controls the past. The party told you to reject the evidence of your eyes and ears. It was their final and most essential command. In the end, the party would announce that two and two made five, and you would have to believe it. It was inevitable that they should make that claim sooner or later. The logic of their position demanded it. Not merely the validity of the experience, but the very existence of external reality was tacitly denied by their philosophy. If both the past and the external world exist only in the mind, and if the mind itself is controllable, what then? Cut off from contact with the outer world and with the past, the citizen of Oceana is like a man in intracellular space, who has no way of knowing which direction is up and which is down. The rulers of such a state are absolute, as the pharaohs or the Caesars could not be. While Orwell was primarily concerned with the excesses he saw in the Soviet Union, Huxley directed Brave New World at Western Technological Society. Instead of a grim party that ruled through fear, the Brave New World had a benevolent group of corporation-type managers. Satisfactions were guaranteed by emotional engineers. Huxley's future world resembled Orwell's in that all physical experience was rigidly limited. Orwell's list was considerably grimmer, but Huxley realized that the point was a short list rather than a grim list. Sensual pleasures were encouraged in Brave New World, programmed into people as infants through hypnopedic messages repeated thousands of times as they slept. The messages encouraged sexual promiscuity, attendance at mass entertainment such as feelies, movies with tactile stimuli, and most important, the ingestion of drugs such as soma for any and every unpleasant feeling or little distress. The goal was to keep people focused on their own satisfaction and limit their needs to those that could be conveniently satisfied by the social engineers. This precluded discontent. Most important, life was contained within planned, controlled environments. People were programmed to believe that any natural experience was inconvenient or disgusting. The idea of personal love or caring for one's own infinite, especially to the extent of breastfeeding, was made so horrible that the very thought of it would send people groping for their drugs. <coughs> There is no underground in Brave New World, but there are two contrasting societies. One modeled after the Zuni and Hopi villages where Huxley lived for a time in the 1920s is the home of the Savages, museumized remnants of the non-technological past. The city people take helicopters to these places to observe the Savages' strange and sickening ways. The second society, confined to islands, is filled with the mistakes of a genetic and hypnopedic assembly line people who have expressed the cardinal aberration, dissatisfaction. In a foreword, Huxley added to later editions of the book, he mused on the trends he saw in the world. To deal with confusion, power has been centralized and government control increased. It is probable that all the world's governments will be more or less completely totalitarian before the harnessing of atomic energy. That they will be totalitarian during and after the harnessing seems almost certain. Only a large-scale popular movement toward decentralization can arrest the present tendency. At present, there is no sign that such a movement will take place. There is, of course, no reason why the new totalitarianism should resemble the old. Government by clubs and firing squads, by artificial famine, mass imprisonment, and mass deportation is not merely inhumane. It is demonstrably inefficient. And in an age of advanced technology, inefficiency is the sin against the Holy Ghost. A really efficient totalitarian state would be one in which the all-powerful executive of political bosses and their army of managers control a population of slaves who do not have to be coerced because they love their servitude. To make them love it is the task assigned.
This could be achieved, Huxley believed, by new technolog technologies offering a greatly improved technique of suggestion by the dissemination of drugs, by mass spectacles to unify experience and feelings, and by eugenics, which would standardize people themselves. Writing in 1932, Huxley was not aware of any single technology that could achieve this standardization and unification process, but he saw the technology would inevitably lead in that direction. It was his particular genius, I believe, to perceive that the critical element was the creation of the joyful cooperation of the people being controlled. Huxley made the assumption, natural to the 1930s, that governments would be the main propagators of pleasure controls in the future. Only later have we seen the emergence of transgovernmental corporations that exercise similar powers, molding living and transportation patterns, rechanneling human experience, instilling habits of mind, and using hypnopedic technologies to do this programming. Huxley understood that no matter who the controllers are, their success depends on confining experience and awareness to predetermined patterns. Both Huxley and Orwell recognize that human feelings in any wilderness experience were complicated and unwieldy and revealed alternative realities. They were therefore dangerous to the controllers. Anything connected to natural, savage awareness must be ridiculed and eliminated, and all experience must be contained within controlled artificial environments. In a large society, technology is a good standardizer, and the confinement works best that technology has been enshrined. I could go on with examples from dozens of science fiction works on the theme of technological control of reality. Sometimes it is deliberate, but sometimes it's in Solaris. The use of technology to produce autocracy is not so much deliberate and conscious as it is evolutionary. As technology has evolved, step by step, it has placed boundaries between human beings and their connections with larger non-human realities. As life acquired ever more technological wrapping, human experience and understanding were confined and altered. In Solaris, these changes happen in a non-specific order over time until people's minds and living patterns are so disconnected that there is no way of knowing reality from fantasy. At such a point, there is no choice but to accept leadership, however arbitrary. Such leadership may very well not plan its own success. It emerges organically at the moment when human experience has been sufficiently channeled and confined. In this cultural analog of mass sensory deprivation, simple, clear statements assume a greater authority and profundity than they deserve. Whoever recognizes that such a crucial moment has arrived, that people's minds are appropriately confused and receptive, can speak directly into them without interference. The people who are spoken to are preconditioned to accept what they hear, like the Solaris astronauts or the poor, puzzled masses of 1984. Technology plays a critical role in this process because it creates standardized, arbitrary forms of physical and mental confinement. Television is the ideal tool for such purposes because it both confines experience and implants simple, clear ideas. Seen in this way, a new fact emerges. Autocracy needn't come in the form of a person at all, or even as an articulated ideology or conscious conspiracy. The autocracy can exist in the technology itself. The technology can produce its own subordinated society as though it were alive, like Solaris. Eight Ideal Conditions for the Flowering of Autocracy The three fictional works I have described, when combined with those rare political writers who approach autocratic form from the point of view of technology, Jacques Ellul, Ivan Illich, Guy Debord, Herbert Marcuse, begin to yield a system of preconditions from which we can expect monolithic systems of control to emerge. These may be institutional autocracies or dictatorships. For the moment, it will be simpler to use the dictatorship model. Imagine that like some kind of science fiction dictator, you intended to rule the world. You would probably have pinned over your desk a list something like this. 1. Eliminate personal knowledge. Make it hard for people to know about themselves, how they function, what a human being is, or how a human fits into wider natural systems. This will make it impossible for the human to separate natural from artificial, real from unreal. You provide the answers to all questions. 2. Eliminate points of comparison. Comparisons can be found in early societies, older language forms, and cultural artifacts, including print media. Eliminate or museumize indigenous cultures, wilderness, and non-human life forms. Recreate internal human experience, <coughs> instincts, thoughts, and spontaneous varied feelings so that it will not evoke the past. 
3. Separate people from each other. Reduce interpersonal communication through lifestyles that emphasize separateness. When people gather together, be sure it is for a prearranged experience that occupies all their attention at once. Spectator sports are excellent, so are circuses, elections, and any spectacles in which focus is outward and interpersonal exchange is subordinated to mass experience. 4. Unify experience, especially encouraging mental experience at the expense of sensory experience. Separate people's minds from their bodies, as in sense deprivation experiments, thus clearing the mental channel for implantation. Idealize the mind. Sensory experience cannot be eliminated totally, so it should be driven into narrow areas. An emphasis on sex as opposed to sense may be useful because it is powerful enough to pass for the whole thing and it has a placebo effect. 5. Occupy the mind. Once people are isolated in their minds, fill the brain with prearranged experience and thought. Content is less important than the fact of the mind being filled. Free roaming thought is to be discouraged at all costs because it is difficult to control. 6. Encourage drug use. Recognize that total repression is impossible, and so expressions of revolt must be contained on the personal level. Drugs will fill in the cracks of dissatisfaction, making people unresponsive to organized expressions of resistance. 7. Centralize knowledge and information. Having isolated people from each other and minds from bodies, eliminated points of comparison, discouraged sensory experience, and invented technologies to unify and control experience, speak. At this point, whatever comes from outside will enter directly into all brains at the same time with great power and believability. 8. Redefine happiness and the meaning of life in terms of new and increasingly uprooted philosophy. Once you've established the prior seven conditions, this one is easy. Anything makes sense in a void. All channels are open, receptive, and unquestioning. Formal mind structuring is simple. Most important, avoid naturalistic philosophies. They lead to uncontrollable awareness. The least <coughs> resistible philosophies are the most arbitrary ones, those that make sense only in terms of themselves. Popular philosophy and arbitrary reality. There is considerable evidence that the science fiction vision of arbitrary reality inevitably leading to autocracy has already begun to materialize. We can see it in action in the quasi-religious philosophies that are now sweeping the country, gathering in millions of devotees. The techniques used in gathering adherence to these burgeoning movements are startlingly similar in conception to 1984, Solaris, Brave New World, and the eight-pointed list just offered. The results are also similar. Converts effectively submit to having their minds reconstructed along simpler, flat, narrow, but most important, unrooted channels. This allows them to embrace arbitrary information as though it were grounded in concrete reality. In a world where alienation and confusion are common conditions, these new philosophies offer a comforting mental order that accepts and absorbs all contradictions. The danger is that once people's minds are so simplified and receptive, they become vulnerable to any leader, guru, or system of forces which understands the simplicity of the code and can speak the appropriate techno-speak. Like a mass of Manchurian candidates, the people whose minds have been retrained into passive channels by these technologically based processes are available at all times for imprinting. In this way, they merge with and can accept advertising mind, television mind, and other simplistic intrusions without the slightest belch of rejection. I'm going to be using EST as the example to show how thinking patterns are restructured, but not because it is any worse than any of the other currently popular systems. In many ways, it is benign in comparison with Scientology or the mind control used by Reverend Moon. Neither is it worse than advertising and television. However, EST is interesting because it operates in a realm totally outside the media while nonetheless utterly recreating reality in an arbitrary form. In fact, its failure to realize its potential as a world movement stems from the failure of its founder, Werner Erhard, to grasp the use of the media, though he tries and tries. The EST training sessions are always held in huge hotel meeting rooms which have artificial light, air conditioning, no windows, and are characterized by the kind of non-decoration typical of such places. Trainees are met by EST graduates and trainers. 
all of whom wear coded name tags and amazingly similar clothes and facial expressions, cheerful like airline attendants and advertisements. Hard folding chairs are arranged in neat rows facing a stage and microphone. The instructions are absolute. No talking, no sitting with friends, no eating or drinking. In an 18-hour session, there is usually one short meal break and one or two bathroom breaks. No moving around the room, no clocks, no taking notes. There are absolute rules on exactly how to wear your own name tag, how to sit, how to hold the microphone when speaking into it, how to acknowledge other people's reports, whatever the content, what you say is good how and when to look into people's eyes. Above all, you must follow instructions immediately into the letter. If, for example, someone does not wear the name tag in exactly the prescribed manner, or shows up a minute late, he or she is publicly humiliated and threatened with expulsion. The violator is told she or he is breaking an agreement, but of course there was no real agreement in the usual sense of two parties working out a contract or understanding. This is agreement in the hierarchical model, as in a military situation where rules are pre-designed and then imposed. You agree, or else you are punished. S can't put you in the brig, so the punishment is exclusion. All these rules break any contact with outside grounding. In this new floating environment, the trainers become the absolute authority, 1984, and the source of all salvation. Although they, are continu they continually give credit for all the rules and activities to their absolute authority, Werner Erhardt. We do this because Werner says this is what works. What it works for is never explained because either you get it or you don't. But I'm happy to tell you that what you get in the end is training in a new pattern of thought and a floating logic. The trainers lead the trainees through a series of long repetitive exercises which include the use of implanted imagery and hypnosis. These are combined with a series of games, including deliberately silly, funny games, which nonetheless require full participation, that is, submission to the game, before one is permitted to stop. Included are self-humiliation and humiliation by the trainer. The only purpose of these is to break ordinary mental patterns and let go of earlier tapes and records. Once that is done, new ones can replace them. That is not to say that breaking tapes cannot be useful therapy, but in the case of S, you get Werner tapes to replace parent tapes. Time is a critical element in the training because it takes quite a while before all the trainees become unified in the experience of living up to the instructions of the leadership, discovering the appropriate responses, and developing a peer group understanding of what is expected. Meanwhile, the trainer retains a grim visage. People who protest are told they are bringing their own belief system is, which is what they are there to stop doing. People are told not to compare what goes on in the S training with anything else they have experienced. In this way, S maintains its floating, separated quality, like the sensory deprivation subject floating for hours in a liquid tank, or the astronaut in the space station. Slowly, the isolated environment, the endless series of instructions, the fixed patterns of behavior, the repetition and the boredom, raise the volume of immediate experience, so that any connection with the world outside, including past experience, recedes and disappears as though it is the abstract and the room, the real, Solaris. The room becomes the whole world. The people in the room are all of society, embodying all values, as delivered from the mountain, Erhard. The trainers are the ultimate authorities. Reality is here and now. Nothing else exists. 1984. After several days of this environmental and contextual onslaught, any confusion and resistance people brought with them gives way to the desire for acceptance, and then the construction of a new ground of reality can begin. When trainers say ground of reality, they literally mean the structuring of a reality where there is none, space station. Here is a summary of the new est reality. Everything is belief. Everything that we see or experience of the world is only an outgrowth of our belief that what we see and experience is the way things really are. Reality, then, is nothing more than an agreement as to what is real. Therefore, problems that we may have, or problems that may exist in the world, napalm, genocide, police repression, loss of jobs or lovers, pollution, and so on, are real only because we believe they are real. In fact, they exist only in our minds. If we do not acknowledge them, they don't exist. So we effectively create these things with our belief systems. So do the napalmed kids, the Jews in Germany, and the laid-off factory workers. <coughs> This is a very comfortable attitude for much of today's world. People who get it, like it. It's not only a fun game, mixing up all those perceptual tricks in one's head, but there's something that passes for mystical in the notion that one creates one's own reality and the world doesn't really exist. 
It makes people feel they have special powers. It is a comfort because it simultaneously relieves trainees from making better sense of their artificial, arbitrary world, which is literally nonsensical and ungraspable, and at the same time it asserts that they determine whatever world they wish. If things don't go perfectly, well, that's the way they created it, and it must be for the best. It is simultaneously creation and submission, total responsibility and irresponsibility, involvement and non-involvement, according to personal definition. Now, it is certainly true that if you believe a thing is a certain way, let's say you believe yourself to be competent or beautiful, or that you will succeed in your new career, then that will make your belief more likely to become reality. Dale Carnegie taught that 50 years ago, so does every loving parent. So est can benefit many people who might otherwise turn themselves back at every conflict. If there were nothing attractive in S, then obviously no one would follow it. When people fully accept the idea that all reality exists solely in their own minds, and that nothing outside their minds is definitely concretely real, each person then has unlimited personal power to create and define reality. It is now up for grabs. There is no cause. There is no effect. Relationships do not exist. Money does not exist. Jobs do not exist. I have known several est trainees who carried this belief into new levels of disillusionment and a loftier sense of personal failure because they were unable to create food or meaningful contact with other human beings when they needed it. <coughs> More important, when these assumptions of personal creation are extrapolated out of the individual realm and applied to society and politics, a philosophy which holds a napalm baby responsible for having created its own reality as a political philosophy, then we have something dangerous on a systemic level. Power does not exist unless one decides that it does. Oppression does not exist, politics does not exist, and neither does nature. In this denial of everyday worldly reality, all realities become totally arbitrary, creating the perfect precondition for the imposition of any new ground of reality within the void. Though it may be nonsensical or fascistic, any reality is acceptable. From 1984. Anything could be true. The so-called laws of nature were nonsense. The law of gravity was nonsense. The fallacy is to believe that somewhere or other, outside oneself, there was a real world where real things happened. But how could there be such a world? What knowledge have we of anything, save through our minds? All happenings are in the mind. Whether it is Werner Erhardt or Big Brother reconstructing the mind, it is true that once mental processes are disconnected from planetary sources or concrete realities, then all validation of truth is impossible. Everything is acceptable. One constructs one's own truth. War is peace. Hate is love. Anything can begin to make sense, but only within its own self-contained, unrooted bubble of logic. Once the bubble contacts the Earth, however, the logic evaporates. There is nothing arbitrary about the reality of an earthquake, or the collision of cars, or the loss of a job, or the stabbing to death of one person by another. Nor is there anything arbitrary about one group of people subjugating another, either through military or economic means. When such events happen, then they actually happen. They are outside human definition. Reality can become arbitrary only within the confines of a mental framework. People who live in direct contact with the planet itself are not concerned with any such questions. <coughs> the difference between Erhardian religions of the present moment and Indian or nature-based religions of other cultures or earlier times is that Erhardt's is abstract. Its ideas depend upon their own uprootedness, unrootedness. Nature-based religions, including even Zen Buddhism, are concrete, involving direct observation, totally functional, and integrated perceptual systems that see things as they are and experience life directly, person to planet, person to person, and person to self. When American Indian religions speak of responsibility, there is no question of responsibility to self as opposed to group. The one cannot be separated from the other. Erhard-type movements are outgrowths of the wider alienation from source that I've been describing, which makes all things possible because nothing is grounded, definite, and personally verifiable. These religions would remain mere curiosities or aberrations if they did not fit so neatly the technologically created arbitrary environments, but they are growing at a wild rate. As they grow, they turn further to the right, producing real monsters like Reverend Moon and others, no doubt, still to come. They reset the minds of millions of people to believe that all things are arbitrary, and since this is so, that nothing actually matters, and therefore nothing needs improving. 
I will quote briefly from a letter I received from a young woman, Maggie Disco, just after she completed the S training. The letter reports on the cathartic moment when the trainer reveals to the trainees the beauty of the concept that there is nothing to be done about anything. Stand by for revelation. After our minds are in the appropriate mush state, the trainer winds up for his greatest moment. He looks us over and begins, letting his voice rise to a booming crescendo. It is all hopeless, he says to us. No use whatsoever. There is no hope. That's what is. It's not depressing or anything else. It's just hopeless. Not only that, but we are hopeless. We are also machines. And so that we get what machines we are, we are told that to be in touch with our own little voice saying, I am not a machine. That's how much we are machines. We are stimulus response machines. That's just the way it is. That's what's so. Uh, up until this point, no one involved in the training has smiled. Exactly when in this harangue the trainer begins to smile, I am not sure. I was perceiving a difference, and finally it dawned on me that the man was beginning to smile. A shared, secret smile. The entire environment of the room changed at this moment. The fact that we were machines was surpassed by the fact that we were for the first time being included in the world of Est. A lot of people were still functioning well enough, even after this long period, to get upset at the idea of themselves as machines. It was their last hold on resistance. By the end, however, people either stopped commenting or agreed. If people held out too long, the trainer got into a smiling tirade about them having to be right, that all they were doing was trying to survive by making someone wrong. It was another one of those circular processes he always used which made it impossible to argue with him, or even to remember, once he was swimming in his words, that it was he who needed to be right. Est depended upon it. But he had all the cards from day one. The amazing thing is that even with everything I know about how fascism operates, after a long enough time, I lost touch with my logic and began wanting and needing the approval of this asshole and the smiling plastic robots around him. There was a moment there when I was with them. I don't think that Werner Erhard is a particularly dangerous person. I've met him several times. He attends a lot of San Francisco cocktail parties. He strikes me as another aggressive, success-oriented man who fell into something hot because of his years around auto showrooms, management seminars, and Scientology workshops. What makes him not dangerous is that he has never figured out television. Though he would like to push F through television, when he gets on, he goes flat. He doesn't work on television, to put it in his own terms. He knows the medium changes his message, but he can't figure out the dimensions of the change. Dangerous or not, Earhart and some of his contemporary gurus are tinkering with an amazingly powerful form. They have learned, as the science fiction dictators have, that if you control environment carefully enough and confine human experience totally enough, you can shatter all human grounding. This leaves the subject in such a disconnected state, you can easily predict and control how he or she will respond to the addition of only one or two stimuli. These are, in effect, mass sense deprivation experiments. They leave people floating without connections, their minds separated from their bodies, open to implantation of any kind of arbitrary logic. In the end, their minds have been restructured to accept whatever comes. They are clear, simple, open, receptive channels. All personal experience irrelevant. All complexity eliminated. All points of reference disposed of. Floating freely in space. All information is arbitrary, the product of mind. One piece of news is equal to this next. Everything is believable and not believable at the same time. There is no reality aside from mind. The only existence is belief. As we will see in the latter half of this book, television does the same thing in virtually the same way. Schizophrenia and the Influencing Machine On September 27, 1973, a young man walked into the lobby of San Francisco television station KGO-TV and began shooting. He killed an advertising salesman before he himself was killed by police. The local media then pieced together the story. The man had been in and out of mental hospitals for several years, and his complaint was always the same. He said that a receiver had been implanted into his body in a secret operation that was constantly broadcasting to his mind that he couldn't turn it off, that he was in agony, and that it was making him crazy. His action at KGO was presumably an attempt to silence the broadcast. He had taken a previous trip to Hawaii to escape the broadcast signal, but to no avail. The very few mental patients go so far as to shoot up broadcasting stations, the number of disturbed people who say they can't get broadcasts out of their minds is apparently growing. A description of this problem was offered in the Bulletin of the Menninger Clinic by Dr. Joseph Robert Cohen. He described a woman obsessed by television signals. 
For many months during the course of her hospitalization, she made frequent reference to television. When she referred to television, she would develop a look of ecstatic terror on her face. In various ways, she described how she was being controlled, persecuted, and tormented by television. She had clairvoyant experiences with other patients mediated by television. She variously described herself as being hooked or taped into television. Periodically, she would tell me everything would be all right if they just wouldn't turn on the television set. Dr. Cohen described his patient's distortion of the very word television into tell-a-vision. He felt this word distortion explained how she could fantasize that television was a machine of infinite power, which inexorably demands that ego-alien material be told through it. Cohen goes on to say, The singling out of various instruments as the source of trouble is common in regressed states where projection is the predominant future, feature. With the advent of television, it has become a frequent clinical feature. Most mental institutions in this country now keep television sets operating during all waking hours to occupy their patients without a thought that this could possibly have a negative effect. Dr. Cohen does not mention whether he ever considered merely turning off the television set, as the woman was asking. In 1919, Dr. Victor Tausk, a colleague of Freud's, wrote an amazing article called On the Origin of the Influencing Machine in Schizophrenia. Tausk wrote that a significant number of patients describing their problems as being caused by an influencing machine operated by alien forces. These aliens represented belief systems threatening to the patient's own and which were being forcibly implanted in the patient's mind. The influencing machine usually has gigantic wheels, gears, and other paraphernalia, Talsk says. It often has the ability to project pictures and invisible rays in some way capable of imprinting the brain. The pictures frequently emanate from a small black box and are flat, not three-dimensional images. The machine and its emanations can produce feelings and thoughts in the victim while removing other ones, according to Talsk, by means of rays or mysterious forces which the patient's knowledge of physics is inadequate to explain. It creates sensations that in part cannot be described, says Talsk, because they are strange to the patient himself and that in part are sensed as electrical, magnetic, or due to air currents. Soon, Talsk reports, the victim cannot distinguish information, feelings, thoughts, sensations, memories that have been received from this external source from those that have been personally generated or the result of personal experience and discovery. Talsk's hypothesis, similar to Cohen's, is that patients create this machine fantasy as an outward manifestation of an internal confusion between the external and the internal worlds, the world of one's own thoughts and the concrete world outside the person. This confusion has its roots in early childhood, Talsk says. At a certain age, a child seeks a reality beyond the parents, seeks to contact an outer world, and so begins exploring. To the degree the child succeeds, it learns to integrate and process the wider world as experienced. It can tell the difference between the impulses, images, and experiences which are connected to the world outside, and those which are totally self-generated, floating, not rooted in the world. If the child has made this distinction, then the projections of his or her own mind can be distinguished and identified. This is sanity. The schizophrenic, says Talc, does not learn to make this distinction and cannot tell which images emanate from inside the mind and which are connected to experiences in the world. At this point, all experience, whether internally generated or the result of an interaction with the world, is equal. Projections of the mind take on the same quality as direct experience of the world. One's experience of the world becomes unreliable as do one's own thought processes. Both become floating, unrooted all are equally internal and equally external. At this point, Tusk suggests, the patient will create an influencing machine fantasy as a physical manifestation of the confusion, capable of implanting images which are in the form of rays, capable of implanting alien realities outside of one's own experiences, capable of changing one's feelings. This machine causes the patient to fall into utter confusion about what is real and what is not what is internal and what is external. Doubtless you have noticed that this influencing machine sounds an awful lot like television. The mystery is how the phenomena could have existed in 1919 before the apparatus was invented. Dare I suggest that television was invented by people similarly preoccupied as an outward manifestation of their minds. <coughs> in any event, there is no question that television does what the schizophrenic fantasy says it does. 
He places in our minds images of realities which are outside our experience. The pictures come in the forms of rays from a box. They cause changes in feeling, and as we will see, utter confusion as to what is real and what is not. All reality becomes ethereal, existing only in our minds. Like the machine of Talsk's suffering patients, television is a final manifestation of an already apparent confusion. This confusion existed at the time Talsk was writing, but it has now been institutionalized by the ubiquitousness of the artificial environments we live in. A real world which cannot be questioned has been submerged beneath a reconstructed human-created world. We live inside the manifestations of human minds. Like the child seeking outside connection, we find only the projections of other humans. We can't know the natural from the artificial since the processes that would reveal that are nowhere visible. We are cut off, floating in space, living within a nationwide sense deprivation tank. We see a stimulus, a light, and we cling to it. It becomes everything. It causes images in our brains. We call this experience, but we can't tell if it is our experience or something else. It is in our heads, but we didn't create it. We don't know if it is real or it isn't. We can't stop the broadcast. We accept whatever comes. One vision is equal to the next. One thought is as good as the next. All information merges. All experience merges. We take everything on faith. One explanation is the same as the next one. Contradictions do not exist. We have lost control of our minds. We are all lost in space. Our world exists only in memory. Everything is arbitrary. TV is the guru speaking in reality. We have merged with the influencing machine. We are the Solaris astronauts. End of argument one.